Hi, and welcome to the Ultimate Physics 2 Tutor, Volume 2. And the entire concept and topic of, of really this DVD set here is all going to be in the topic of waves, okay? Let me give you sort of a brief history of where we've been with the courses so far and sort of a peek at what we're going to do after this course to let you know where this one really fits in the sequence, all right? Usually when you take Physics 1, either in high school or in college, the very first thing you study is Newtonian motion, which is dealing with projectiles, really. How, how do things move when you throw them in gravity, collisions, all the things associated with motion and, uh, and, and collisions and energy transfer and things like that. That's Physics 1, and that was covered in the very first physics DVD that I released. The DVD that comes after that is Physics 2, but that course is too long to do in one, in one actual uh, DVD release, so I split it up into Volume 1 and Volume 2. Physics 2, Volume 1, is the DVD on thermodynamics, which is a big fancy word that just means heat transfer. Anything related to heat, uh, temperature, uh, entropy, laws of thermodynamics, engines, things like that were all covered in the DVD right before this one, Physics 2, Volume 1. Now this DVD is Physics 2, Volume 2, and it covers the remainder of the material that you'll typically see in a University Physics 2 class, and of course you cover some of these topics in high school physics as well. And the topic here is all going to be about waves. So just a brief outline of this course that we're going to study here, this DVD set here, all about waves. Basically in this section we're going to start the, the uh, discussion by talking about oscillations. You've all seen waves. You, you have an idea in your head what a wave is. The goal here is to solidify that, show you what it really means in terms of physics, and the very first way to do that is to start talking about oscillations. How do things oscillate up and down? What does that mean mathematically? And what does it mean in real life? And let's look at some real examples. So that's going to be the topic here. Then we're going to go off and start formalizing that in terms of energy transfer in an oscillation and how that can be set up into a wave and how that wave can travel and, and propagate and go and hit something and deliver energy um, to whatever it is it's, it's hitting. We're also going to talk about interference of waves, which I'm sure you've heard of before at least, in terms of music and, and interference of, of sound waves like that. We'll talk a lot about sound waves, we'll talk about Doppler shift, which may seem like a familiar term to you, uh, and we'll make sure that it's, it's rock solid before you get done with this class. And we'll talk about uh, quite a bit of that. Now this is all in, pr in uh, preparation for Physics 3. In Physics 3 you learn all about electricity and magnetism. And You've probably heard that when you have electricity and magnetism interacting, you get an electromagnetic wave, right? And those are, those are light waves, those are radio waves, those are microwaves, those are x-rays. All of those waves that have different names, they're all electromagnetic waves. So this course is really laying the bedrock, the foundation that you're going to need to understand electricity and magnetism in terms of the waves that you're bathed in every day of your life here on Earth. Waves are hitting you, electromagnetic waves, right? And that's exactly what this course is going to help you uh, get ready for. So this topic in this section right here, section number one, is titled Simple Harmonic Motion and Hooke's Law. Now one thing I always say when I begin these physics lectures is that you always are going to get these really fancy, complicating sounding names, okay? And they're going to maybe throw you off a little bit, maybe you think something's really difficult just because it has a, a fancy sounding name. Right? This is one of those things where it looks like it's, it's, it's maybe going to be hard. Simple harmonic motion. What does that mean? It certainly doesn't sound like easy uh, thing to think about. But in fact, you've seen simple harmonic motion all of your life. Every day of your life, I imagine that you've probably seen something with some kind of simple harmonic motion. So let's dig into that, figure out what that is, and we'll understand why it's so important to learning about waves. So in order to do that, rather than just flashing a definition up here, I actually prefer to write them because it forces me to slow down and it also looks exactly like you're going to see it in your, uh, in your physics lecture when you go off to class because the teacher hopefully will be writing these things down too. So it's, it's kind of forcing me to, instead of throwing a whole paragraph up and you have to soak it in, I mean you can look at it word by word. Simple harmonic motion. Alright, what is it? Basically, it's the motion of something could be anything could be a washer could be a, a garbage truck it could be a, you know a, a, a um, acorn whatever any any piece of mass motion of something back and forth uh, 
about some point in a periodic manner. Okay, simple enough so far. Motion of something back and forth about some point in a periodic manner. Now, this is something also very important. This motion will look like a cosine. All right, now I threw something crazy at you. A cosine, what is that? Well, let me give you a piece of advice, okay? If, and I mean this seriously, if the word cosine and sine, okay, from back from your trigonometry days or maybe your advanced algebra, whatever classes you took, cosine and sine, if those words just, just confuse you and maybe you don't know what they mean, maybe you can't remember any of that stuff, please take a few minutes, pause this video, and go off and just look that up. I'm going to go over it here with you. I'm going to draw lots of examples, so don't think I'm going to just drop you in the grease. But you really do need to know what this is because, because everything in life builds on each other. You learn how to learn your ABCs before you can learn words. If you didn't learn your ABCs, then words and sentences would be basically incomprehensible. You wouldn't be able to learn that. Well, this entire course on waves is all going to be about cosines and sines. That's what a wave is. There, I've, I've laid it out for you. Anytime you write a wave down, in fact, I, I can almost with certainty say any time you write a wave down, whether it's electromagnetic wave, sound wave, pressure wave, um, you know, anything like that, that simple harmonic motion, which is what we're learning about here, is always going to be a cosine or a sine. If you remember back to your trig, cosine and sine have basically exactly the same shape. And I'm going to draw some pictures here in a second. They all go up and down about the axis like this. They go up and down just like a little roller coaster. The only difference between a cosine and a sine is that they're shifted relative to one another. If you actually plotted a cosine and then you plotted a sine, they would look exactly the same. It's just one is displaced a little bit with respect to another, okay? So they're exactly the same thing. But you really do need to have a familiarity with what it is. It doesn't mean you have to be a trigonometric expert at this point. We're, I'm going to walk you through it, but you need to know what the basic shape of a cosine is. You need to have a basic understanding of what a cosine is. If you don't know, then please do yourself a favor and, and refresh your memory on that a little bit. And you could do that with the trig, the trigonometry DVD that I have. It'll get you going really, really quickly. But I think you'll, you'll get the hang of it here. We'll just walk through it slowly. So what is this simple harmonic motion stuff? It's the motion of something back and forth. Um, and this motion will look like a cosine. And we're going to draw a lot of pictures of that. What is the simplest thing you can possibly think of that has motion of something back and forth? Periodic. That's what simple harmonic motion is. It's something that's periodic which just means it happens over and over again with a certain period. It just starts over again, it starts over again, it starts over. Look at my fingers. What does it look like? It looks like a swing set, right, from your, from your playground days. Or it looks like a grandfather clock with the pendulum that's swinging back and forth, back and forth. You might say to yourself, that doesn't look like a cosine. How can that possibly be a cosine? We're going to draw some pictures, and I'll show you that those examples, the swing set, or the grandfather clock, um, a slinky, if you shoot a wave up and down through a slinky, right, that's, that's simple harmonic motion too. And that, if you break it down, really does look like a cosine. So let's dive into that. Before we can really get into understanding how it really looks like a cosine and really write down the math behind what, what simple harmonic motion is, okay, we need to define some terms. So the first thing we're going to define is the term that you all heard, frequency. Okay, and by the way, we're not even really talking about a wave yet, okay? We're, we haven't even really gotten to the concept of a wave. A wave is just like at the beach when you think of a wave. It's something cresting and just kind of coming in, and that wave is delivering energy to you. It starts out 50 miles out, and it rolls on in. It's some sort of disturbance, right? That's what a wave is. And when it hits you, it literally can push you over, so it's delivering energy to you. That's a wave. We haven't even gotten to waves yet. We're just talking about motion, that goes over and over and over. A pendulum doesn't really go anywhere. It just stays in the same place, back and forth. A slinky, if you hold it and just kind of shake it like this, you know, you, 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 you have some, some motion in there, but it's not really going anywhere. That slinky's not moving down the road. Or, or a, a, a swing set, when you push someone, he goes away and he comes back, goes away, comes back. Those are simple harmonic motion. They're not waves really going anywhere right, 50 miles down the road and delivering energy. That's just harmonic motion. So when we talk about the frequency of that motion, that harmonic motion, what are we talking about? 
when we talk about the frequency. The frequency is simply the number of oscillations per second. Okay? Now, typically, when you talk about the number of oscillations per second, you have the unit of hertz, which is Hz. Hertz, okay? Now, if you have a child on a playground, okay, and you have them in a swing, and you push them, and then they, they go away from you, and then they come back, and then you don't touch them again, let's say. That's going to slow down a little bit, but let's just say it doesn't. Let's say it's a perfectly frictionless swing. Away from you, back. Away from you, back. If you time your watch, however many cycles that that swing completes in one second is the frequency. It's the number of hertz. So if you push that child pretty slow, and let's say they go away from you, and then they come back. That's one cycle. He's come exactly where he started. That's one cycle, okay? Now, if it takes one second for that person on the swing to come back, one cycle every second, that's one hertz. That the frequency of that harmonic motion is one hertz. If you, uh, you know, somehow excite that person and push them in a different manner, so that that person swings five complete times in one second, then he would have five cycles per second or five oscillations per second, so it would be five hertz, right? So obviously that person would have to be going faster in order to do five hertz, five times per second. But that's the idea of what frequency is. These are things that you have experience with all the time. They just have fancy words like oscillation, frequency. Now when you tune the radio, when you tune to a frequency in the FM band, let's say, it's 100, let's call it 100.1, uh, is usually like in your radio, 100.1 or 102.5, right? Those frequencies are, are frequencies too, but they're in megahertz. So instead of cycles per second, that's millions of cycles per second. So when you tune to 102.5, that means that the radio wave hitting your antenna is oscillating back and forth, okay, uh, at 102.5 million times per second. Okay, that's pretty darn fast. And by the way, what's oscillating? I'm getting way ahead of myself. What's oscillating? That's the electric field coming in, hitting your antenna. Switching directions, 102.5 million times every second. And that's just because light is super high frequency, right? That's what, what light, everything hitting your eye is super high frequency. Your eyes are adapted through evolution millions of years to, uh, to respond to, to high frequencies like that. So that's the concept of frequency. Super, super, super central, super critical to anything talking about waves. So that's why I'm spending time on it. Next, what is this thing called, the period? I've actually used this word several times already. And hopefully I've given you an idea of what it is, um, just through, you know, through context. It is the time in seconds it takes for one, I'm going to underline it, oscillation. Okay? The time it takes in seconds for one oscillation. So when you're going to find, we're going to write this mathematically down here in a minute. I'm just giving you some definition. What you're going to find is period and frequencies are inverses of one another. They're related, in other words. There's an equation, a really simple equation that relates them to. Okay? Uh, so you can see that they're both related because they both deal with the oscillation. This is the number of oscillations that fit in one second. And this is the time in seconds it takes for one oscillation. So if I'm pushing that person on the swing, okay, and he comes back to me and it takes one second, the period is one second. If I push him in a different manner and it takes 10 seconds, really slow for that person to go away, five more seconds for that person to come back for a total of 10 seconds to make that one cycle, then the period would be said to be 10 seconds. Period is always in seconds, it's in time. And frequency is in hertz, which is oscillations per second, cycles per second. So I'm not going to get too deep into this now because you'll see it really, really easily with the mathematics that we'll do in a second. But frequency and period are basically inverses of one another. They are directly related to one another by a really simple formula. And that's because they both deal with the oscillations. This is the number of times you get of oscillations in one second. This is how long it takes for one of those oscillations to actually happen. In, in seconds, okay? The third definition I'll give you before we'll, we'll finally draw some pictures here is the concept of the amplitude. That's another thing 
that has a fancy word uh, that is uh, super easy to understand. Just like most everything in life, you know, things are usually not so hard to understand uh, once you, you know, once you dig into it, but they can usually intimidate you. Amplitude. It's how far, I'm going to put in parentheses, in meters, okay, how far in meters the maximum displacement from rest position from rest position okay how far in meters so it's a distance the maximum displacement from rest position now displacement is a big word but you know Displacement just means distance. It means how far something's moved. That's all displacement means, okay? So when you read about amplitude, what you're really saying is going back to the swing set analogy. I walk up to the swing. It's empty. There's nothing there. I put somebody in there, right, and I'm, I'm about to push him or her. The swing is completely vertical. That's his rest position. That's the position that the thing is in if I don't even touch it. That's what is called rest position. And we'll, we'll draw lots of pictures here in just a second and show you where that is on a graph, okay? Now, it's sitting there. Now I decide to push him. First thing I do is I pull him back, or her, back, and then I let go. Now, in real life, the swing slows down over a period of time. That's just because of friction here in the top where the chain connects to the top. It's, it's, it's slowing it down. But let's say there's no friction. Let's say it's this perfect you know, ice or something up there that's just causing it to glide by and not slowing anything down. If I pull that person back and then let go, in theory, if there's no friction at all, that swing would continue to swing in the same way exactly forever, forever and ever and ever, and it would just go up and down. Gravity would pull it down all the time, and it would go up and down and up and down. Now, if I stand to the side and I look at this swing that's going like this, back and forth, and let me do it toward you. Let's say it's swinging back and forth like this. This is the rest position right here in the middle because that's where the swing was. So if I go over here, the swing is going to travel this far, before turning around. Then he's going to come back. He's going to travel this far before turning around. Now, yes, in real life, the swing is curving, but let's just forget about the curve for a second. He's traveling past the midpoint. He stops. He turns around, comes back, stops, turns around. This distance from the rest position to wherever it is the, uh, the cycle starts over again, where he turns around, that's called the amplitude. All right, That is called the amplitude. Very important. It's the distance from the rest position to wherever he turns around. How far in meters the maximum displacement from the rest position? This is the maximum displacement because he goes no farther than that. He just turns around and goes the other way. The amplitude is always going to be the same on both sides of the rest position because oscillations are always symmetric about the rest position. Right? So if you go off and look at a, you know, anything that has an oscillation to it, you're always going to find something turning around and going the other way and turning around and going the other way. That rest position is always in the middle. Over here on one side of it, that's called the amplitude, and it's the same as on the other side, that's called the amplitude. It's the distance from the rest all the way up to the maximum. So let's finally draw some pictures. I love pictures. Pictures can help. I hope you have a good idea here with the swing set to understand how, how this uh, works, but um, you know, a lot of times pictures can really help. So let's do that. So what I have here is a wall. We're going to move a little bit away from the swing set, and we're going to draw um, a spring. And right here, I'm going to draw a mass. So this is a mass. This could be lead or wood or whatever. It could be whatever. But it has a certain mass here. Okay, so I'm going to put, you know, M, mass M. And this spring has a certain stiffness. We'll talk about it later. But basically has a stiffness to it. And, and here we are. Now, let's say this is the rest position. Let's say I have a wall and it, the spring is attached to a mass and that spring you know, has a natural place that it sort of likes to settle. If you just let it go, that's called the rest position. So that is exactly what this is. So we're going to just kind of draw a dotted line here, down and down here, and we'll say that this is, we'll call this the rest position. right? So this is the middle. I haven't done anything to it yet. Now let's say I take the spring and I grab it and I stretch him out, let's say to here, and then I let him go. What do you think is going to happen? Well, I pull him 
I let him go. He's going to fly over here. The spring is going to get compressed, right? And then he's going to turn around and fly this way, and he's going to get stretched. And he's just going to keep doing that because when I compress the spring, the spring's going to push back. And then when he finally gets here, I've stretched the spring, so the spring also pulls back. So if the spring system has no losses, in real life you do have losses and everything slows down, but if you had no losses, then this thing would just keep oscillating forever and ever and ever, and we call it simple harmonic motion. So let's say that I did pull it back, and I pull it back to here, right? So let me do my best. Let me draw this wall down here. So once I pull him back, the spring is stretched, okay, there, and I have the guy here, and I let him go. He's going to fly through here, and then he's going to go, and he's going to be compressed. Let's say he gets all the way to here, and the spring is incredibly compressed right here up against the wall. So I've tried to draw that symmetric. I may not have succeeded. This distance here it should be exactly the same as this distance right here because the mass, I think maybe I need to move it a little bit closer, more like maybe like this, just to make it clear. This mass should, be, should have the same distance on this side of the rest position as it does on this side of the rest position. Okay, so let me put this here. All right, now why did we draw this? Because, okay, this distance from right here to the rest position is called the amplitude. Right? It's exactly the same distance as from here to here because it's all symmetrical, right? So I could have easily drawn an arrow from here to here and said this is the amplitude. This distance is in meters. I can actually measure it with a ruler and I would say, in real life, I would say the uh, amplitude of this spring system is 0 0.5 meters or whatever. I would say 0 0.25 meters. It would be a number. That would be the amplitude. When you tell somebody that, they would know right away that's the maximum distance that that thing moves past the rest position. Okay, now while I have this drawing up here, I mainly drew it to show you what the amplitude really, uh, really looked like, but while I have it up here, I want to take the time to draw something else. Let me ask you a question here, right? What, what do you think the speed of this, uh, this guy is going to be right here, and what do you think the speed of this guy is going to be right here? Well, I pull it back. Let's say he starts oscillating. He gets compressed here, and stretched here, compressed here, and stretched here. Do you think, what do you think the speed is going to be right here and right here? This, where I've drawn it, is the exact moment that that thing slows down and turns around. So what do you think the speed is going to be right at that point at which he turns around? The speed at those points on both sides where he turns around is going to be zero. Literally zero. Because even if you think about the swing set, if you push someone, they go up, 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 and there's a moment of weightlessness right at the top where you just turn around, you get the butterflies in your stomach. That's because you're not moving at all right there, but then gravity pulls you right back down and you start moving again. So right here, you're moving the slowest. And literally, you're moving at zero right at the end. Here, you're also moving at the slowest because you're literally turning around about to go back the other way. Now, what do you think the relative speed here is right in the center here? Just think, that, think about that for a second. I've turned around, the spring is fully extended, and it's pulling me as hard as it can pull me, and I start to speed up right through the center line here. What do you think my relative speed is there? Well, at the midpoint there, you're going to be going the fastest in this motion here. And it's exactly like the swing set when you think about it. You sit down, someone pulls you back, lets you go. And then let's say that you don't have any losses and you keep going. At the moment you turn around on both sides, you're not moving at all. At that instant in time, right when you turn around, you're not moving. But then you start speeding up. As you go down to the bottom of the swing, as you pull through that, that, that uh, rest position right in the center, you're moving the fastest right there. Every point beyond that point, you're slowing down as you reach the top of the next hill. So right here, you're moving the fastest. All right. I want you to try to keep that in your head because it really helps. We're going to be doing a lot of things with springs, uh, and it's going to also help when we get into you know, uh, uh, sound waves and other things to, to visualize what's really happening here because a lot of times you can think of air molecules with the forces between the air molecules. You can kind of think of them as having a little spring between them, even though there really is no spring there. It's useful to think about that. So this is a graphical picture of what... Um, of what, the, uh, of what simple harmonic motion is. So you see, I want to show this as, a, as kind of a bragging point here. Something as complicated as simple harmonic motion, which sounds really, really complicated, is nothing more than something you played with all your life. Something attached to a spring and the thing moving back and forth or a swing set. 
right? So what I want to do next is I want to graph this. This is just a picture showing you what's happening. But what we want to get in the habit of doing is actually graphing it, showing what the distance looks like as a function of time. Because we know we pull the spring back, we let it go, and we start a stopwatch. Well, that thing's going to be moving back and forth as time goes on. The position of that mass will be different places because it's moving back and forth. We want to plot that because that will be um, basically how we are able to look at this simple harmonic motion. Okay, so what we want to do is switch gears a little bit and say draw a little a little um, x y axis here. So over here is time. Okay? And over here along this axis is displacement. In other words, how far from the rest position? How far away from the rest position have you have you made it? So let's say you pull the spring back and you let go. So you start, you start the graph at the moment you let go. So you've pulled back to the maximum position that you ever planned to be. So you're going to start off being relatively high. This is the distance in meters away from the rest position. So at time zero, right when you let go, I'm the farthest away. Okay. Now I let go and I travel and I, I, I get over here to the, uh, the center to the rest position. And then I go through that position and I make it all the way over here, uh, in which case I basically turn around again. So what your motion's really going to look like, just like I told you in the beginning, is a cosine. That is a, that is a cosine. It goes on and on forever. I mean, you could continue drawing it because if you plot a cosine, you'll see it goes on forever. And of course, if there's no friction here, this motion will go on forever. So it matches a cosine. Cosine always starts at the top, like this. And it goes down and up and down and up. It starts at the maximum displacement here, let's say I pulled it back by whatever. If I wanted to put some, <clears throat> some numbers into this, I could say, well, I pulled it back by 0 0.5 meters. I pulled it back 0.5 meters. That was the top thing. It goes through zero because this is, this is a, uh, uh, the distance from the rest position. As it makes it through this point, we cross down through here and we go negative. The reason we go negative is because this is defined as the zero position, one side of that position is going to be defined to be positive, the other side is going to be defined to be negative. So if this is my reference point, these, let's just say, are positive, and this, anything on this side is going to be called negative. So we go negative, but then we turn around, we go back through the rest position here, and then we get back exactly where we started over here. And then it just keeps going over and over and over. Now the reason I'm really drawing this is because the period, if you remember, which is over here, the period um, is the time in seconds it takes for one oscillation. So one oscillation starts up here and exactly where you end up, which is right here. So this from here to here is a period. It's a period because that's one complete oscillation. That's one complete back and forth. I started over here on the left, and I ended up exactly where I started with on the left. You have to go all the way back to where you came in order to have one period. Okay, so you have to have one complete cycle, one complete oscillation, which is what I said over here. One oscillation. This is one oscillation. So I cut it off right there, and I say the distance between here and here is one period. So this is, a, this is a time axis here. So if this were, you know, let's call it, let's say this is one second, this time from here to here. If, it, if I was marking it off and actually had a scale here, if it were one second, I would say that the period of this oscillation, the period, which is the time it takes for one oscillation to happen, this time would be one second because that's exactly where I came back to. It took one second to do that. Okay? And then if I wanted to, to, to graphically show where the amplitude was, the amplitude is the, let's read the definition again, how far in meters from the maximum, um, the maximum displacement from the rest position. This is the rest position here, this, this, uh, uh, this zero point right here. Up here is, uh, is one side, and up down here is on the other side of the rest position. So this guy right here, the literal distance from here to here would be the amplitude A. We call the amplitude A. Is usually how you write it down when you write an equation or something. You put the letter A there. So this literal distance here, which let's say in this case we put 0 0.5, that's as far as I pulled it back, 0 0.5 meters, we would say that's the amplitude. So if I were going to draw this thing and label some things, this distance would be the amplitude 
from the axis up to the very top of the motion and the distance in time for one period, one period would be one complete cycle of the wave and I would just look at the scale and I would read the time off. I'm telling you these things because a lot of times on your test, especially you know in the beginning, you'll be, they'll just draw you a picture and they'll say what's the amplitude of this wave and at first it will kind of freak you out a little bit because you're looking at this weird wave and it looks kind of complicated, it looks high tech or whatever with a bunch of oscillations back and forth but you see if you just know what to look for it's really not hard at all. This is the amplitude, how far it swings in one direction okay and the period is how far in time how long it takes for one oscillation to happen now to give you a comparison let me just draw another wave that looks different just to show you how they can look different let me kind of solidify this a little bit so again this is no different it's time and this is the same thing displacement on this axis here displacement about that rest position so what if I drew a different wave totally different characteristics let's say I went down like this and then up and then down and then up and down and then up and then down, and then up, whatever, and it goes on and on forever. And I tried, I didn't do a great job, but these, these things here really should, you know, be exactly, it should look exactly the same on the bottom. They should be at the same distance above and the same distance below, exactly the same like this, right? Because that's how it would look if you tried to plot it. Or if you tried to measure it in the laboratory, it's exactly how it would look too. But you can see that the basic shape of these things, they do look the same. The basic shape of a sign looks the same because when you plot a sign in the calculator, they basically look exactly the same. They have the same shape, but the only difference between them um, here is that this one looks squished, right? It looks squished like this. So if I were going to, on a test, say, what's the period of this wave? Well, I know that the period is how long it takes for one oscillation to happen. So here, I start at the top, I go down, and I end up at the top here. So this distance here would be a period like this. And you can see that this distance here in time is going to be less than this one here. So the period of this wave is less than the period of this wave because the oscillations are happening faster. So it's, it's the time it takes for one oscillation to occur. So because the oscillations are happening much faster, the period is much smaller. Right? The period is much smaller. Now I've drawn the waves in this case where the amplitude looks about the same. The amplitude of this wave could be way up here. It could go way up high and way it could have a totally different amplitude too. But I just wanted to point that out just to show you that basically when you have a smaller period like this, the oscillations seem to be happening faster. Now if you look at your definition, the frequency is the number of oscillations per second. Let me ask you a question. Which of these waves do you think is oscillating more rapidly or with a higher number of oscillations per second? Right? If we look at our scale, if this were one second, if this were one second down here, you have more oscillations happening in that one second. Right? If I, were to, if I were to actually put a tick mark here and say, yeah, this is actually one second. Well, here I've had one oscillation, and here I've had, effectively, I've had two oscillations right? in the same one second. So the frequency here is higher because frequency is a number of oscillations happening every single second. You look at a second and you see how many are happening, that's the frequency in hertz. So, you see, period and frequency really are related. When the period is shorter, the frequency is higher. So, I'm going to write that down. When the period, when the period is lower, whoops, got to spell period right. Period, when the period is lower, smaller, then that means that the frequency is always going to be higher. And that's just because they're directly related. Now, I haven't shown you mathematically why. There's a simple formula that, that shows you this, that relates these two things together, and we'll get to it here in just a second. But graphically, when you draw something with a higher frequency, by definition, it means the period has got to be smaller because the thing is oscillating more. It's oscillating faster. Okay, and likewise, if I wanted to change it, if I had room to draw a third graph, I could take this spring and I could pull it back really, really far way over here, let's say, and then let it go, in which case the amplitude is going to be much higher because I'm going to have pulled it back farther so they're going to be going higher above the, X, uh, above the time axis here. So that means it's, the amplitude would be higher. So you see amplitude is basically how far you pull back if you're looking at like a spring system like this. Okay, The um, period is how long it takes for one oscillation and the frequency is how many oscillations happen every single second. So what we're going to do now is erase the board and then we're going to write down some simple relations that show you how the period 
and the frequency are related to one another and then we're going to actually write down an equation that shows you how this oscillation happens mathematically. Okay, now let's go ahead and write down mathematically um, how the period and the frequency are related to one another. And then let's go ahead and write down an actual equation involving the cosine. We've talked about cosine since the first sentence out of my mouth. We've drawn cosines, but we haven't actually written the word cosine down to show you how the actual thing's written mathematically. So we'll do that here. All right, and then you'll actually have an equation to work with and, and see how it works. So these are things that you'll see in your book. You basically are going to end up memorizing these. I wouldn't even say do it on purpose because it's just going to happen naturally. Now, when we have the period right, the period being the time it takes for one oscillation, we always write that with the letter T, uh, because T for time. I know you would think P for period, but because it's always time, the period is always the number of seconds for one oscillation, we always use the, the um, letter T. The frequency that we use in hertz is always F, F for frequency, so that's really simple, and that's the number of oscillations per second, or also called cycles per second, that you might hear. All right, so what we need to know is the following. These are really important things. The period in any simple harmonic motion that's always going to be a cosine is always going to be 1 over the frequency, okay? And likewise, if you solve this equation for f, if you actually multiply both sides by the little f, so you get 1 on this side, tf over here, and then divide by t, all you're doing is, let's say, solve for f, then just by solving this for f, you'll get the frequency is 1 over the period. Make sure you understand that. There's no magic here. I just move the f over here by multiplying, and then I divide both sides by t. So on the left, I have my f, and on the right, I have 1 over the t that I divide by. There's no magic here. It's really the same exact relation. So literally, in the first part of the course, when I told you and sort of described to you without any math that the period and the frequency were inverses of one another, I literally meant that they really were inverses of one another. The period is literally one over the frequency. The frequency is literally one over the period. They literally are inverses of one another. And what that means in words when something's inversely related to one another is all it means is that when the frequency is high, really, really high frequency, okay, this bottom number is high. So one over a big number is going to give you a small number for the period. So what you're really saying is when the frequency is high, then it means, that's what this double arrow it means, it means that the period is low. Okay? The period is, is a small number. And that's exactly reflected down here. We said that this bottom graph down here had a higher frequency of motion because there's more oscillations per second. And when we did that, we noticed that the period was smaller. So when the frequency is a big number, higher number of cycles per second, the period is always going to be lower, and you can see that with the graphical form down there. That's what this relation means. So likewise, when the frequency is low, very low frequencies, the period is going to always be high. It's going to be a high period, or a larger period. So this is a lower frequency uh, oscillation here, a simple harmonic motion. Lower frequency, lower relatively speaking than this down here. So lower frequency means longer period. And that's because they're both basically connected. You can't talk about frequency without implicitly talking about the period because they're both really dealing with how the thing's oscillating. So you draw that oscillation and your period and your frequency are basically fixed. You read them right off the graph or you measure them. Once you know the frequency, you always know the period. Once you know the period, you always know the frequency. And actually, I want you to remember that or try to because when you work your problems, you'll, you know, you just need to know what you, you can work with what you can solve for. And you should always know when you're given in your problem some kind of frequency, right, that you automatically know the period, okay? Now the book may not give you the period. They may want you to know that you can find the period to solve the problem. But they may not tell you, they may not give you that. So you should know that when you know the frequency, you automatically know the period and vice versa. All right, write one more thing down and then we'll draw some more pretty graphs. The shape of the oscillation is a cosine. And we've said that all together. And you can prove that to yourself just because I've drawn these pictures over here and you can go plot a cosine on your calculator or on your computer and you can see that they look exactly like that. Now, 
The following is going to be the equation in mathematical form of one of these, these simple harmonic motion cases. It's going to look a little crazy at first, but I promise you it will not be complicated. All right, x of, whoops, I already started out wrong. x as a function of time, right? All this means is that when we look at these graphs, we're always plotting the distance, we call it x, the distance x away from the rest position here, which is the rest position, of, let's say, of a spring system, the distance above, and it's always going to be a function of time because you see as I go along in time this way, then the distance above or below the axis is going to be different no matter where I'm at. So it's a function of time. The position of that mass is a function of time. That's what this is saying. It's equal to A, which is the amplitude. We talked about the amplitude, the distance above the axis, times the cosine of, I haven't even shown you this yet, so I'm going to kind of give you a little double whammy here, omega, this is lowercase omega, it just looks like a curly W, times time plus this Greek symbol phi right here. Right? That is the equation of, of, a, of, of these things that we've drawn right here, of these simple harmonic motion cases. Now, I'm throwing you a little bit for a loop because I haven't ever told you what omega really is, and I have never told you what phi is. The reason I didn't is because they make no sense unless I actually have this equation on the board. You already understand what omega is, and you already understand what phi is. I just never told you that you did. So just if you're getting a little anxiety by seeing a complicated looking uh, equation like this, just calm down. You'll understand it here in just a second. Now we already said that this is just simply the distance um, of, from the rest position. That's all x is. That's, that's what we're plotting here. Okay. This we've already said. We know what that is. That's just the amplitude. Right? Amplitude is the maximum distance above or below, it doesn't matter, it's the same, above the rest position or away from the rest position. A for amplitude, super simple. We know there has to be a cosine because we said the shape of this thing is a cosine. So all we have to do is figure out what's on the inside. T is time. You know that time has to be involved here because we already said that the distance of the, uh, the mass connected to that spring from the rest position is always going to be a function of time. We know this. So what are omega and what are phi? All right. This is going to be really simple. All right. This omega is called the angular frequency. It's the angular frequency. And I'm just going to write it down and show you why it has to be written like this. Omega is equal to 2 times pi times f. f is the same frequency we've been talking about since the beginning, the frequency in hertz. All right. So the units of this just to show you, because you'll see it in your book, it's radians per second. All right, now let me spend a little bit of time talking about why you care about this, that it has to be omega. First of all, I told you, we qualitatively looked at this and we said, this is a higher frequency in hertz than this, because it has a, more cycles per second than this one does. So it's a higher frequency. The more squished it is, more oscillations, the higher the frequency, right? Once you know that frequency in hertz, Multiplying by 2 pi, those are just numbers. The number 2 is just a number. The number pi is just a number. 3.14159, whatever goes on and on forever. Right? That's just pi. So if you take the frequency in hertz, which we've been talking about since the beginning, and you multiply it by 2, and you multiply it by pi, you get something called omega. Omega is what we use in here for frequency. The reason that we have to use uh, omega, 2 pi times f, instead of just f, is because when you, when you go back to your trigonometry, you basically need to, anything that you put inside of a cosine to try to take the cosine of something has to be an angle. If you, you have to go back to your trig a little bit, is why I was saying that at the beginning, you really need to sort of remember a little bit of trig, otherwise you might get a little bit lost. But just in layman's terms, anytime you take the sine of something or the cosine of something or the tangent of something or the cotangent of something or whatever, whatever is on the inside, which is this number inside here, that is a bunch of letters, but it's going to reduce down to a number, whatever's in here has to be an angle. The only way you're going to get an angle is if it's in radians or degrees. There are other systems too, but those are the only things that we're going to talk about. So when you're in physics or, or chemistry or any of these things like this, you're almost always going to be dealing even in calculus, in radians. So, whatever you feed into this cosine in your calculator has to be in radians. But the, the, the uh, hertz that we were talking about before, the number of oscillations per second, 
had nothing to do with radians. That was just the number of oscillations per second. I mean, there's, there's no radian involved in that. But if you take the number of oscillations per second and you multiply by 2 pi, by the way, why do you think it's 2 pi? If you remember back to your trig, you have a unit circle, right? How many radians are in a unit circle? All the way around. It's 2 pi radians. One circle, in other words, one cycle around that circle, that unit circle from trig, is 2 pi radians. So we take the frequency of our oscillation, which is how many oscillations every second, we multiply by 2 pi because that's the number of radians in every unit circle. And what we end up with is the number of radians that this wave goes, so to speak, every second. Now, that's omega. We multiply it by time, okay? So we're going to have radians per second, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, radians per second, and we multiply by second because this is omega times t. The seconds cancels with the seconds, and we're only left with radians. So, and this phi I haven't even talked to you about here, but this is in radians also. So the bottom line is you have to deal with omega because you have to deal with radians. Because when you take the cosine, the cosine of something, it has to be in radians. Uh, effectively is really the answer. So those, that's a little bit of theory, but if that doesn't float your boat or if you really don't totally quite follow it, you know, try to, try to understand it. I really do want you to try to understand it, but if it's just not quite making a lot of sense, it's simpler just to mechanically remember what to do. You take your f, whatever it is, multiply by 2 pi, you get a number. It's a number. We call it omega here, a little w. This number sits right in front of t for time. Okay, that's it. That's a number. This is a number. This is a number. And we'll find out in just a second that this is a number. But it's called the angular frequency. And you always know what it is once you know what the regular frequency is. You have to deal with angular frequency. That's the number one thing that people do wrong in physics, too, is when, in the beginning. When you are given a frequency, somebody says, oh, this, this, this um, oscillation is 15 hertz. Write down what the equation looks like. And you stick a 15 in here because you're not really, you know, you think, oh, it's a frequency. You put 15 in front of the time, completely wrong because there's no angular information. You have to take 15 times pi times 2, then that number is what you put here for omega, which is the angular frequency. All right, that's enough of that. We'll, we'll see a lot of this when we get into the problems. All right, what is this? This is called the uh, phase angle. All right, this is the phase angle. And I'm not going to write down a lot of words, but it's just a number. It's a number in radians. So what you have here is a number in radians plus this thing, which once you do this multiplication, omega times time, because of the units we talked about a minute ago, you'll also get radians. So you'll have radians on the inside. Cosine of some radian gives you a number. Multiply it by the amplitude, and then that's going to give you the distance above the axis for that particular unit in time. You go forward in time, you multiply by a different value of time, everything on the inside changes a little bit, cosine of that changes a little bit, and so you just plot the number as you go, and you'll see that it, sh it shapes uh, shape like a cosine. Okay, so what does this phase angle really mean? I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to tell you generally what it really means. It's just a number, okay? First of all, it's all it means. But what it's really doing is it's telling you where this graph starts. So if you notice, all the information should be in here to reproduce exactly the shape of this motion. The amplitude tells you how high it is. The frequency, which is 2 pi f, the angular frequency, tells you how fast the oscillations are, effectively. This number is basically telling you where to start the graph. In other words, you see it's periodic like this, right? You see that it's periodic. Do I start the graph here, or do I start drawing it from here, or do I start drawing it from here, or from here, or from here? How do I know when to start the thing? Well, that's what the phase angle does. And basically, it's relating back the initial condition of the motion. Here in my example, I pulled back the string and uh, spring all the way and then I let go. So I knew that I had to start the graph at the maximum displacement, uh, right? But depending on what your problem is, it may not be quite so simple. This phase angle is basically going to show you where to start the graph. Basically, it lets you shift this graph around. And if you remember back to, um, I'll give you one little aside that hopefully will help a little bit here. If you remember back from algebra, f of x is equal to x squared. You all, you all know what x squared looks like. It's a, it's a parabola, right? It goes something like that. Now, you, you learned somewhere in algebra, in the depths of your brain a long time ago, that if I have a new function, f of x, 
and I say it's like x minus 5 squared. You see, the function really looks the same. It's a squared and there's an x in there. It's just that I've taken and I've sort of taken my variable and I've subtracted something from it before squaring it. The effect of that is I've shifted this function. I've shifted it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units to the right. Right? I've shifted it five units to the right. That's what I've done. So when you take your variable and you subtract something from, from it, and then you, you have the rest of the function the way it was, the net result of that is you push it to the right. If I have plus here, x plus five, the net result is I take my original function, I shift it to the left, right? So this phase angle is just letting me do that with this cosine. When you draw a cosine in your calculator, just cosine of t or something, you're going to get a cosine that starts up here and it goes on and on forever. If you plot cosine of t minus 10, then no, it's not going to look quite like this. It'll look, it'll have the same shape, but it'll start in a different position because it's shifted. If it's a minus sign, minus here, it'll be shifted to the right more. And if it's a plus sign, it'll be shifted to the left more. That's nothing more than your, than your algebra that you studied a long time ago. Um, and, and you should be able to just sort of look at this and see you know why you think that's the case. I mean if you if you look in here basically if you put x is equal to 5 in here 5 minus 5 gives you 0 0 squared gives you 0 so it's basically moving that 0 point of the function way over here to the right this shift is basically moving to the right the only thing you have to remember is when it's minus it shifts it to the right when it's plus it shifts it to the left that is exactly what this phase angle and radians does and in real life when you're modeling a problem that's going to be related back to you know, what we call the initial conditions of your motion. What it, how, how was it started? Or, alternatively, maybe not how it was started, but when did you start measuring? Maybe, you know, maybe we uh, started the motion and didn't turn our computer on for maybe uh, 10 milliseconds later. So we didn't, maybe we didn't quite catch the first part of this motion because it just started already. And then we turned the cameras on and we saw it move and was already moved a little bit. So when you write that equation down, if you're, if you're going to say t is equal to zero is maybe right here, it doesn't quite look like a full cosine t, let's call it t zero because I just turned my computer on. Well, I would have to have some kind of phase angle in there um, to, take, to, to take that into account if I'm going to call that t is equal to zero. So it's basically letting you talk about that initial condition. Okay, one more thing I'll draw to kind of drill this home is just a little graph here. And I hope I can draw it without, uh, without screwing it up too much. But this is the same thing. It's time over here. Uh, and over here, up and down is going to basically be the displacement or x. So actually, just to make it clear, I'll just call it x of t. Because that's what you're measuring, the distance from, from that. So if you were to look at a regular old cosine, it would always start up here, and then it would go down, and then it would go up exactly to the same height. Well, not exactly the best cosine, but you see what I'm trying to do here. And then it goes down, and so on. It basically goes up and down like this. This, I'm just going to draw a little arrow. This is regular cosine omega times t. Okay? Omega times t with zero being the phase angle here, there's zero because there's nothing else written. So it's a regular cosine when there's no phase angle at all. Now, if we throw a phase angle in there, maybe it's starting, then maybe it, maybe it starts down here. And it gets to a maximum here. And then it goes down like this. And then it'll go down like this. And maybe something like this. Okay? So you can see the shape of this looks exactly like the shape of the first one. It's just that it's shifted. If you, in fact, if you kind of take this and kind of pretend that it keeps going, you can see that this is exactly moved over. That's all that you've done. If I were to write an equation for this one down here, it would be cosine omega times t minus pi over 2. Pi over 2 is just a number, but it's a number in radians, pi over 2. Now, one thing I want to show you while I have your attention at this here, first thing I wanted to show you is, is this is illustrating the phase angle just like I did just a second ago. When I have a phase angle here, it's a minus, so that means I've just taken my original function, shifted it to the right, I've shifted it by pi over 2 radians, which is, if you remember your unit circle, unit circle here, pi over 2 radians is right up here, right? So you've shifted it by one quarter of a circle. This is pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. 
So this is one quarter of a circle, or one quarter of an oscillation. So I've shifted the thing one quarter of an oscillation. You can kind of see that this is about, it's shifted about a quarter of an oscillation over. Okay? That's what I wanted to show you. When you have a phase angle with a minus sign, it shifts it to the right. That's all it's doing. That's all a phase angle is. But while I have your attention, let me ask you, what does this actually look like? This guy right here. Well, if you are sharp on your trig, when it starts here at the origin and it goes up with a sinusoidal shape like this, it's not a cosine, but we call it a sine. Right? So I told you at the beginning, cosine and sine are exactly the same things. It's just that they're shifted versions of one another, shifted relative uh, to one another. And that's exactly what I'm trying to show you here. Cosine and sine are exactly the same thing. So most of the time here in the beginning we're going to be talking about cosines because that's how most books do it. So I'm trying to do things that you'll see familiar in your book. All right. Now when we get later down the road some books switch over and start using sine. Now when you look in your book, if it has sine instead of cosine, and you're like, man, he's got a typo here, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, cosine and sine are exactly the same thing. The only difference is they're shifted with respect to one another. So you can see that this guy, cosine omega t minus pi over 2, is equal to sine of omega t. And all I'm trying to say here is in your books, when you, sometimes you might see sine, sometimes you might see cosine. They all describe the same shape. They're just different with a phase angle. That's all I'm trying to say. So as we go through the course, sometimes we'll see cosine, sometimes we'll see sines. Don't get too worried about that. They have the same shape. They just differ by, by a uh, phase angle here. So this is the most important thing I wrote here. You need to know what this is. This is the form of all simple harmonic motion. They always have a sinusoidal shape. In this case, we wrote it as a cosine. There's an amplitude out front. Don't forget, cosine swings between, when you plot it, always swings between plus and minus 1. So when you multiply it by the amplitude, you're allowing the swing to go from plus or minus whatever the amplitude is. So that's why the amplitude's out in the front. The stuff on the inside is simply the parameters of, of the actual oscillation. This is how fast it's oscillating, how many cycles um, per second, but converted to radians per second. And this just tells you where you started uh, where you started the graph from, basically. So let's go ahead and erase the board, write a few more really important things down, uh, and then we'll move into some problems. Okay, so what we're going to do now is write the equation down, the position of the body that's oscillating as a function of time, and then we're going to go and step through and find the corresponding velocity and the acceleration. We're going to write those equations down because those are going to be used in your problems time and again. And then we're going to draw a little graph to kind of show you how the position, the velocity, and the acceleration are related. And in the end, what's going to happen is hopefully you'll be able to look at those graphs and look at those equations and in your mind equate it back to that swing set that we've been talking about, or that block on a spring, and what it's doing is it's going back and forth. Don't ever get into the situation in physics where you're just blindly looking at equations. Always try to take them and apply them to what you know, and they'll stay with you forever, okay? So, here's what we're gonna do. The first one is the familiar position as a function of time, and we already said that's the amplitude, uh, which is the how far it's doing the swinging times a cosine, which gives it the, the sort of the, the uh, sinusoidal shape there, omega t plus a phase. So some frequency, here's the function of time that gives us the time dependence, and here's some phase angle, which basically tells you um, the starting position uh, or, or sort of the starting conditions when you start that oscillation, okay? And we're going to call this, uh, which is what you already know, this is the position as a function of time position as function of time, okay? Now, how would you calculate the velocity? Now here's sort of where I have to fork a little bit in the class. If you've taken uh, calculus, or, or if you're taking calculus right now, you should know that any function that is a position as a function of time, or position function, you can take what we call the derivative of that function, and that will spit out the velocity as a function of time. You can also then take the velocity, take the derivative of that, and out will spit out something called the acceleration. Those are just mathematical techniques, just like in the early days in algebra, you learned how to solve an equation. Once you learned it, then you could apply it to lots of equations. These are just the tools in calculus we use to go from position to velocity to acceleration. Uh, it can be used for an electron moving down the road, or it can be used for a block. I mean, it's the same sort of thing. So, if you've taken calculus, these derivatives are really simple. If you haven't taken calculus, then the answers, the things that we're going to get to here in circle in a second, are going to be the things that are important to you. Okay? So, how do you do it? The velocity 
as a function of time. If you look at this and try to remember how do you take the derivative of this, this is a constant. Okay, so he's just going to sit out in front there. And what you're going to end up having here, when you think about it, this cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. All right, it's negative sine. So what you're going to end up having in the end is you're going to have a negative sine omega t plus phi. But then you have to take the derivative of the inside. This is just a constant, so the derivative of this doesn't even matter. The derivative of omega t is just going to be omega, and he comes out. So this omega is going to come out, and the amplitude is there from before because the constants always hang around when you're doing derivatives in the outside. They don't really go anywhere. They just stay out front. So in the end, this is the derivative of the position, as we call it, the velocity. Negative omega times the amplitude that we were given here. This omega, by the way, is the same thing you were given here. It's the same number that was inside in front of the t. Sine omega t plus phi. Everything else here stays the same. This is a simple derivative from calculus one. Derivative of cosine gives you negative sine. Uh, derivative of the inside just gives you this omega which comes out and that's why you're you're given that there. So we're going to label this and we're going to call it, this is what we call the velocity as a function of time. Alright, a velocity as a function of time. So obviously this is going to be a very important equation that you're going to use all throughout this course. This is a very important equation that you're going to use all throughout this course. Now, if you take the derivative of this, of this uh, velocity here, so actually let me write one more thing just to make it clear. So we put take derivative, okay, then you get this down here. Now, if we take the derivative of this velocity, then what we're going to have is what we call the acceleration. So the acceleration, which is a as a function of time, is going to equal what? Well, we take the derivative of this. What is the derivative of the sine function? Well, that's just a straight up cosine. No, no sine change or anything. So you can put a cosine omega t plus phi. But you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. This is a constant, so that derivative doesn't count. The derivative of this part is just omega, omega times time. Because, by the way, in all these derivatives, we're taking the derivative with respect to time. Because that's the variable that's oscillating, that's causing the oscillation, the time variable. Derivative of this with respect to time, the omega just comes out, multiplied by all of this stuff, you're going to end up with negative omega squared times a cosine omega t plus phi. So there's the magical acceleration. Now, if, so let me go ahead and write this. This is, this is the acceleration as a function of time. All right, now if you've taken calculus, hopefully these derivatives don't scare you too much. They, they're pretty elementary once you, once you get into your calculus. If you haven't taken calculus, or if you're in high school physics, maybe you don't have calculus under your belt really, it doesn't really much matter because in the end, these steps here that go from here to here and from here to here, that's in the realm of calculus. Those are things you learn you know, in the future from now, but they're just mathematical tools like anything else. Just like you learn how to add. Before, at one time in your life, ad addition was really scary and you didn't really understand it, but once you understood it, you understood how to apply it. Same thing here. Taking the derivative lets you go from position to velocity to acceleration. The details that we were talking about here to go from those steps uh, forward are important to, to be able to do, certainly when you go on in, into, into advanced stuff, but if you're not taking calculus, then it, it really is, isn't that much important. So that's why I circled these guys, because these equations are the ones that you, you need uh, to have. So this is the position. This is describing the position from that equilibrium, from that starting position, that rest position, on either side, plus or minus of that rest position. This is the velocity, how fast it's moving as a function of time, and this is the acceleration, how much is it speeding up and how much is it slowing down. Let's draw a quick picture to see how these three um, graphs really look uh, compared to one another, and then we'll go from there. So, what we're going to do, just to kind of make it, I guess, easy, what I will do is use some colors. So what we're going to have is three graphs. Top graph is going to be for the position, the bottom, uh, the middle graph is going to be for the velocity, and the bottom graph is going to be for the acceleration. So here is the position, so we're going to call this x of t. And just in case you forget, I'll put position. Position as a function of time. So actually, this is, this is time. This is time over here, and this is 
the position as a function of time. This is the distance on either side of that equilibrium, that rest position, that spring with the mass here, and you leave it alone and it sits in one place. Pull it back, let it go, and it starts to oscillate. Well, this distance that we're plotting, x of t, is how far away from that rest position it is as a function of time. And you know it's going to slide around both sides of that rest position. So it's going to go up and down um, this axis, and that's why it's a cosine, because cosines do that. Okay, so this is basically what it's going to go like. This is basically what it's going to look like. Let's go ahead and put some evenly spaced, hopefully even, evenly spaced tick marks here. I'm not going to draw, you know, real numbers and all that stuff. I'm just trying to give you the, the basic shape. So what you're going to have is uh, this graph is basically going to start up. Cosines are always start up like this. They're going to go maximize up there, maximize up there, and do like that. That's basically a cosine. He's going to start up at a maximum. He's going to come down to a negative maximum here. He's going to go up. He's going to come right back down. Okay? And then what we're going to do, and that's the position. Okay? And we're going to talk about these in just a second. Let me go ahead and get them on the board. And here's the time. And now this guy is going to be the velocity as a function of time. Now notice that we redrew this over here. This is a cosine. So we drew a cosine graph. This is a sine right here. So we know that signs start a little bit differently. Normally a sign starts like this and goes, goes down like this, but notice we don't have a sign. We have negative and then omega a times sine. So this stuff out here is just multiplying the, the thing by, by a number. So this stuff out here is important if you're really going to graph it with numbers, but since I'm just trying to show you the shape, I'm, I'm not going to worry too much about this. The negative sign makes that, makes that entire sine function flip over. So essentially what you're going to want to do to make, make it easy to draw this, you want to draw some, some dotted, whoops, you want to draw some dotted lines here to help you get your bearings. So let me do that here, get my bearings right here, and all the crossings of the, of the axis there, just so I can help draw the thing. Now normally it's a sine function which goes up and down like this, but when you have a negative out front, it basically multiplies and gives you the mirror image. So this sine is, is a, since it's a negative sine, it's going to start, start on the bottom. So essentially what it's going to do is it's going to start out like this and then it's going to cross the x-axis right here. It's going to go up to a maximum here, cross the x-axis here, and then like that. All right? So that's essentially what it's going to look like. I think that's a pretty good, I think that's a pretty good uh, representation here. Okay? Now the final one I'm going to draw is the acceleration. So I'll put that as t. And this would be acceleration as a function of time. Now, if we look back over here, we're back to a cosine again. Cosines start at the top, and they go down, and, and they look just like this guy, but it has a negative out front, also with some junk multiplied out in front. I'm not going to worry about for the purpose of these graphs here. But this negative sign is going to cause this cosine to be a mirror image. So it's going to start out. If I were going to draw my little helpful purple lines just to get my bearings, basically those are going to be the, uh, the crossings. So it's going to start here, it's going to cross up here, maximum, it's going to cross down here, and it's going to cross right there. So that should be a pretty good representation. Now let's think about what we're drawing here. First of all, let me say, I have drawn no numbers here and I have put no numbers here. This, these graphs are only to show you the general shape. Okay, obviously in front of all of these functions there are numbers. These omegas and a's, these are just numbers and that would, you know, if you actually built a system and measured it, you would have a, a frequency, a mega, and you would have an amplitude and those would be numbers that would be sitting out here. So that when you really plotted it, you would have a different scale here, but I don't care about scale, I'm just trying to show you the shape. You have a cosine, you know what that looks like, negative sine, so you take a sine function, flip it over, and then negative cosine, so you take a cosine function and you flip it over. I'm stacking them up to show you how they relate to one another. When you take a block, when you think about it, or a swing set on the playground, whatever you're comfortable thinking about, but that, let's think about a block, and it's in a spring, and you attach it to the wall, and it's in this rest position. Now you pull it back, right, to, to whatever distance you're going to pull it, and you let it go. Well, at that moment you pull it back, that is, it's basically its amplitude. How far away from that rest position you pulled it back is, is the, the maximum that it's going to end up traveling back and forth. So when you start the clock here, you start off at a maximum. Now, as the time, time ticks on, obviously you go closer and closer to the, to the rest position, to the, to the normal rest position, which occurs here. This is basically uh, at x is equal to zero. This is right here in the middle where, I, where the rest position is. And then it flies right through that, and it goes over to the other side, and then it turns around, and it comes back, and that's what the shape is showing you here. 
Now look at the velocity. What this is showing you here, the velocity is zero right here where we start the clock. And that makes sense because when you pull the block back and you let it go, right at the moment you let it go, I'm not talking about once you, you watch it zip away from you, but right at the moment that you let it go, right as the acceleration is starting, that block is not moving at all. At the moment you let it go. Of course, as soon as you let it go, it, it goes and it flies, you know, and it, and it starts zigzagging back and forth. But at that moment, it's zero. All right. Now, as the block goes through its rest position, right through its rest position, right in the middle, where everything sort of, if you leave it alone, it's going to sit right there. As it go, travels through that point right here, its velocity becomes maximum. That makes sense because if you pull a block and you let it go, as it zips through that middle point on the way over to the other slide, its maximum velocity is going to be right as it zips through the middle right there as it continues on and goes through to the other side. So you see the point. Then it finally goes and, and uh, over here, whenever it gets to the other side and it starts to turn around and come back the other direction, the velocity over here is, again, zero because it's turning around. Now, that's the velocity. Now, when you look at the acceleration, that hopefully should make sense as well, too, because when you think about it, right, uh, oh, let's say right, right here, let's look at the very beginning. When you pull it back and you let it go, you're stretching the string to the maximum point, so that's why this is here. Your velocity is zero because you just let the block go. It hasn't really moved yet. Well, at that moment, your acceleration is a maximum. In other words, your acceleration is the maximum value. Plus or minus, don't get too wrapped up on the plus or minus. That's just because of the direction the thing's zigzagging back and forth. But the acceleration is a maximum way down here. And that's because when you pull a string, I mean a spring, with a block, and you let it go, at that moment, the force that that spring is pulling on your block is maximum. It's, it's pulling on it the maximum that it's ever going to pull, and so that block is accelerating as fast as it can. That's why you start out with a, with a big number here. Eventually, as you go through the uh, rest position here, right through the sort of the, the position where the, where the, where the spring would, would just sort of sit there if you let it all go, right as it zips through that point right there, the spring isn't pulling as hard on the block, and so it's, the acceleration isn't as much. So the accelerations happen on the extremes whenever the thing turns around. That's another way to think about it. As it goes and it turns around and it turns around and it turns around, it's slowing down and going the other way, slowing down and going the other way. That's whenever the acceleration is maximum, and that's why the acceleration is always going to be a maximum right here whenever the uh, guy is turning around. So I just wanted to draw these to kind of give you a, a feel. Try not to get too, too scared of them. Basically the, the cosine the sine functions are very important because in science and engineering they represent real life. If you actually took a spring and stretched it and measured the velocity and acceleration and such you would see these shapes, these sinusoidal shapes. Sine, cosine, um, and all the, the, the trigonometric functions like that they are all very important for that reason because they do help um, they do help describe nature. So sine, cosine, and uh, position, velocity, and acceleration. And hopefully this will allow you to see how they all relate to one another. All right, there's one more thing I need to talk to you about before we can work the problems. We have to return a little bit to the spring for a second. We had a mass m, we had a spring, and we had it attached to some wall. We left out a lot of details here. I really didn't talk at all about the spring. But you all know that different springs can have different stiffnesses. And that stiffness is obviously going to completely impact what these graphs look like and what the motion looks like. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a really stiff spring, right, it and it pushes back a lot, that's going to totally change the motion. It's going to make it oscillate faster than if you had a really wimp wimpy spring with really hardly any stiffness at all, like a real slinky or something. You push on, and yeah, it pushes back a little bit, but it doesn't really push back very much. So you're not going to get a really wild motion out of that. So the spring is going to matter a great deal. How do you represent the spring here into, the, into these equations, right? Well, you assign a value k, which is what we call the spring constant. And that comes from something called Hooke's Law. which every physics course is probably going to cover, and it just says that the force exerted by a spring is equal to negative k times the distance I've compressed or I've expanded that spring. This is called Hooke's Law. k is called the spring constant. k is called a spring constant. Okay, the higher the k, the stiffer the spring. The lower the k, the wimpier the spring. And you can see from here what this is saying is that as I take a spring and I stretch it 
x gets bigger. This is the distance, the displacement from the neutral position. So if I stretch it, I'm going to multiply by the stiffness, and I'm going to get a force in newtons, and that force is always going to be pulling me away from the direction I'm stretching it. So that's why there's a negative sign. If I pull this way, the force is going to push me a back against my pole, and if I compress it this way and squish the spring, the spring is going to push against my, um, my pushing this way. So basically the force of the spring is always going to be opposite the direction that I'm compressing or expanding it. That's why there's a negative here. So basically it tells you how much force this spring is exerting. All right, that's exactly what it's telling you. Now I'm not going to prove this at all, but you can show yourself that the angular frequency omega of the simple harmonic motion stuff. It's always going to be equal to, if you have a spring system like this, the square root of K over M. So that's super, super, super important. So I'm going to box that. F is equal to negative KX. And if you know what the spring constant is, which most of the time they give it to you in the problem, and you divide it by the mass it's attached to, and you take the square root, that's going to give you omega in radians per second. This is ready-made to plug into this, any of these equations that have omega in there. This is the angular frequency. And of course you could go get the regular frequency f by using the other formula we talked about earlier. Now if I take this, okay, and I rearrange it and solve for uh, kind of doing some, some math here, I can find the period. And the way I'll do that is I'll start right here and I'll remember that, let me just draw a little box here because I'm going to do a little aside. We know that omega is equal to 2 pi f. We know that. That's just something that was given to us before. And we also know that f is 1 over the period. The frequency is 1 over the period. We talked about that just a few minutes ago, that they're inversely related. So omega is going to be 2 pi divided by t. Just taking f and plugging it in, 2 pi over t. All right? We know that. Now if I solve for t by just basically moving him over here and taking omega and moving him back, t is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by omega. And that's just simple algebra. You take the t, you multiply, get it over here, divide by omega, moves it down here. That's all I've done. I've solved for t. Right? Now we already know what omega is in this spring system, so let me put it in over here. So the period, which is what I'm trying to solve for here, I'm trying to give you an equation for the period, is 2 pi over the square root of what this omega is, k over m. And you could leave it like that, but if you if you do a little bit of algebra, you can flip this over because the fraction is on the bottom. The period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. And that's what I was trying to get to. 2 pi times the square root of m over k because this is basically a fraction on the bottom. Just because there's a square root around it doesn't really matter. If it's a fraction, you can kind of flip it over and, and multiply it. Well, you just leave the square root around it and it's exactly the same thing. So these are just three formulas that you're going to have to have for your homework in this section. You need to know what Hooke's Law is. This is just telling you the force the spring is pushing back on you as you're trying to move it around and push it off and compress it or expand it. This is given without any proof at all. You can measure it in a laboratory actually. If you know the spring constant, you know the mass attached to it, you know automatically what this, this system is going to oscillate at. So the oscillation frequency in radians per second is always going to be dependent on the spring stiffness and the mass. You know those things, you know how fast it oscillates. Also, if you know those two things, you can calculate uh, the period. And, that, and that's just, this is something that you'll see in your books, but it comes directly from this because they're interrelated, you see. We know omega is 2 pi f, we know how f is related to t, and you plug it in using this result and you get this. And you, you could easily do this yourself, but most books give you a little equation for the period there. So if you know m and k, you can immediately get the period and the frequency uh, there. And, and of course, you know what the spring constant is here. So, we've covered a lot of material in this section. We haven't done any problems yet. What I'm going to do at this point, because this has been a very long section, is I'm going to stop for right now, okay? The very next section from now, we'll do our problems. We have quite a few problems to go through to address everything in here. So, if you need to watch the section again, I'll cut it off here because it's getting kind of long. That way you'll have it nice, self-contained, all the equations, all the explanation of what this stuff really is. It's really, really, really important that you understand everything in this section. Everything is going to build on this. Because when you think about it, a wave, which we haven't even talked about yet, even though everything we were drawing on the board looks like a wave, these things aren't traveling anywhere. These aren't traveling waves. Something doing this, this is just a graph of that motion back and forth. 
we haven't actually talked about a wave traveling from me to you and delivering energy to you. It's going to look a little different than what we have here. Not too much different, but a little bit different. But this stuff is crucial because every wave has oscillations in it. You know, oscillations of adjacent elements, and that's what deliver the, uh, delivers the energy off from me to you. So you have to understand how things oscillate or you'll never understand how waves move. And that's the whole point of this stuff, right? So we're going to do that. We're going to stop now. And then when you go to the very next section, we're not going to really recap any of this stuff here. We're not going to write our equations back on the board. We're going to go straight into the problems. So this is Jason. I hope you've understand this uh, section. I hope you, you learn from it. I hope it's clear for you. Go ahead and stop now. Go to the next section and we'll tackle our problems.